just to warn everyone, I am a massive fan of this musical, so hearing this will be somewhat like hearing one of my Doctor Who reviews. Also, I'd like to take this chance to say Timeless, Classic and Tour de Force, since I'm sure their use is inevitable anyway. Adapting stage musicals to the screen is a curious thing, especially nowadays. Phantom sort of gets away with it being set in a theatre, but you lose something in it not being live. Chicago plays on the idea of what if life were a vaudeville show, to make an all-the-world's-a-stage kind of romp. And Les Mis, well, there's really only one thing you lose, whereas Phantom on stage is laden with dancing, breaking the fourth wall and casting the audience in the role of, well, audience, and of course live visual effects. Something I thought I would miss in this film version of the phenomenal global success that is Les Miserables is the way that parts of the set from Act 1 lift, turn and assemble the barricade. Not just impressive, but also symbolic of how all the elements of the first half are now coming together to set the stage for the 1832 rebellion, the conflict which dominates Act 2. The assembly of the barricade is also as iconic as the phantom chandelier or the helicopter in Miss Saigon, if not even more so. In fact, the film version goes right back to the original text, and the people literally throw their furniture, chairs, tables, even a piano out of their windows for the students to take and add to their barricade. I loved it. At first I was dismayed at the film being two and a half hours, not three and a half. But remember that sometimes with stage musicals a song may be a certain length to accommodate the set changes, no matter how high tech. In fact, only one whole song was actually removed. I'm the sort of person who usually complains about changes and usually demands the full version of something. However, wherever they've removed something, added something, or rearranged the order of the scenes, or broken up a scene, they've simply made it more accurate to the book, because again, they don't need to worry about staging. Some of my favourite little bits here or there were removed, but it's film directed by Tom Hooper, famous for uh, The King's Speech, and starring film actors. And Hooper clearly realises that, in the medium of film, a simple look can do the work. The movie of Phantom never entirely managed to escape still being essentially theatre, despite the best efforts of Lost Boys director Joel Schumacher. So much so that The Onion reported moviegoers suffering severe cases of post-melodramatic stress disorder. Several critics of this Les Mis film objected to Hooper's use of so many close-ups. It's cinema, and people don't normally get uh, to be that close to the characters, and even if you are in the front row for a musical, you can see they all have mics taped to their foreheads. Hooper doesn't usually direct musicals, and clearly sees Les Mis as a character piece, and so is focused on the many emotional journeys of the story. One case in point, Russell Crowe does not sing stars with anything like the power I am used to. It should be a show-stopping number that brings someone like me to my feet. But later, when the, uh, the Javert character, having been shown compassion and forgiveness by Jean Valjean, the man whom he has hunted like an animal for decades, contemplates suicide to escape a world he no longer understands, his faith was in the state and the law he has enforced must be obeyed to the letter without question and at all times regardless. Those who break the law must always be punished, and the state is never wrong, surely. But Jean Valjean is a man, not a monster. Has Javert given his whole life to a lie? Can he go on? Who is he? Uh, a scene which purposely mirrors Jean Valjean at the beginning, after being forgiven and even helped by the bishop he tried to rob. I am not a huge fan of Crow and his voice is underwhelming. But he plays this scene as only an expert film actor can. What you lose on the show-stopping number, you gain on the screen presence. In fact, the handling of the Javert character, one of the only two characters to be in the story from start to finish, more or less, is one of the things uh, I really enjoyed uh, the most about this uh, production. In the book, while Javert is zealous, unfeeling, petty, a sort of Vogon in human form, he is also full of valour, honour and a kind of decency, and with it a sort of vulnerability, as if 
he's actually slightly confused by the world around him, even an autistic failure to understand people. The stage version reduces him somewhat to a two-dimensional villain, and the limitations of the stage mean he pretty much embodies the state against which the people are rebelling. Much of the focus is on how he treats Valjean as a convict, a convict uh, the way he takes the word of a gentleman over Fontaine, the prostitute he beat, his deceitful infiltration of the student rebels. After the uprising has been crushed, he is still so relentless in his desire finally to catch convict 24601, Jean Valjean, the evil and dangerous criminal who broke parole after serving 19 years of hard labour for stealing a loaf of bread because his nephew was dying of hunger, that he simply searches through the sea of bodies of the young men and women he had acted as comrade to, deceived and betrayed, and then seen killed before his own before his own eyes. He lifts each body up just to see the face and chucks them down again after a glance, without a thought and at most a sneer. They are only the enemy dead, and they were traitors. Now the rebellion is crushed, all that matters is the pursuit of 24601. He is a human shaped Dalek. In contrast, Tom Hooper's film version shows the bodies laid out in a line, eyes closed and with some dignity as the soldiers are cleaning up the blood-sodden streets. Javert approaches the body of Gavroche, a child who fought defiantly to the end and sacrificed his life for the France he believed in. Defiance against the state and the king that Javert obeys faithfully. Javert takes a military medal from his own uniform and places it gently on the child's body. He does all this before he pursues Valjean, who is carrying the injured Marius, the only other survivor, through the sewers of Paris. For the first time in decades, something honouring this fallen child matters more than the law. While I cannot recall if this happens in the book or not, it sticks out in my mind and is, in spirit, a return to the character of Javert as he is in the book, and, having known the stage version of the character nearly all my life, I shall quote my friend James at the end of Phantom. So, you are human after all, then. A great deal of the story is about faith. Valjean finds God at the beginning after his encounter with the Bishop of Dean shortly after being released. Javert is as much a slave of the law as Valjean had been, the difference being that Valjean escapes. Interesting how two men who came from poverty, in Javert's case born inside a jail, should turn out as opposites. And Marius, Eponine and the other rebels mainly naive students, are ideologically driven to fight for a fairer, liberated France. The Critics' Choice Award for Best Supporting Actress recently went to Anne Hathaway for her performance as Fontaine. If she'd never got any awards for this performance, it would be daylight robbery. The story of Fontaine, which is its own book, the full Les Miserables novel is, is in five volumes, some people's life ambi life's ambition is to get through war and peace. Bitch, please. I'll take another fan moment to say that uh, Hathaway's mother played this part on Broadway many years ago. The story of Fontaine shows her losing her job when the foreman, whose sexual advances she had been refusing, discovers she is an unmarried mother and uses this as an excuse to dismiss her. She sells her hair, then her back teeth, and eventually takes to the streets as a prostitute. This is where the song I Dream the Dream comes in. To those who dislike musicals but do like the music, I would point out that with the context of this part of the story, it is so much more moving. Hathaway sings it not like an X Factor contestant, but in a beautifully understated way. And all in one take. All of this film is sung live to a piano, nothing is dubbed. And Hathaway does not mind appearing bald and emaciated and actually appearing as though all but her front teeth have been removed. And all the emotion is in her face, contorted into agony, tears and saliva and all. Something else the film captures beautifully is the moment when the dying Fontaine is hallucinating her daughter, Cosette, is in the hospital with her. As Valjean promises, he will bring her daughter to her. In the book, 
he is told this is the only thing which could save Fontaine's life. I know the show very well and have a vivid recollection of this part of the novel, and have seen, I think, every film adaptation of Les Miserables. The feeling you get throughout this section of the film is exactly what you feel reading Fontaine. It has never been done anything like as well before, and almost certainly never will be again. That's the thing about this film. It isn't simply an adaptation of the musical. It is a musical love letter to one of the greatest books of all time. If fans of literature think this is a bastardization, let me tell you, this film does not replace the book for me. It makes me want to read it again at twice the age I was the first time, and even read the Victor Hugo biography I was given as a teenager, and, not a fan of non-fiction, barely ever even flicked through. It always surprised me in theatres how people tend not to cry over the Fontaine story when they do cry over some later deaths. Somehow it's all over too quickly, the audience don't have time to get to know her, but here the character comes across so strongly that uh, Hathaway has clearly read the book. And getting as close to her as we do, and her final scenes so utterly perfectly executed, if there isn't a part of you that wants to cry, you are not human. Hooper was clearly nervous about going from this powerful swan song to the comedy relief that is the Thenardiers, the utterly ruthless innkeepers who look after Fontaine's daughter, Cosette. They have been bleeding Fontaine dry with false claims of needing to hire doctors for the child, while in fact treating her like a slave. Not especially funny, but every show needs comic relief. It is these scenes, however, that make me glad that by the end Marius at least punches Monsieur Thenardier in the face. Hooper feels the need to insert an extra scene between Fontaine's death and the introduction of these characters, and they are played by Sacha Baron Cohen, famous for his Ali G character, and Helena Bonham Carter, two actors lifted from the Tim Burton version of Stephen Sondheim's Sweeney Todd musical. Looking and acting pretty much the same. In fact, it never really struck me before, but there is something anachronistically English about the musical's treatment of these characters, almost as if they're the comedy villains from a Dickens adaptation. But back to Sweeney Todd, the Thenardier's scenes could easily be from a Tim Burton film. But somehow this works, dealing with the introduction of these characters after so much sadness by making it absurdly grotesque and giving the next segment of the story an inevitable change of pace, while putting very theatrical humour onto the big screen. I am, however, grateful that a lot of the Thenardier scenes from later in the show are either severely truncated or else totally dropped, since they were in danger of simply not working tonally in a cinematic version. I find it difficult to say what I think of Hugh Jackman as Jean Valjean. I think that's because, although he is very different from any stage portrayal I've uh, seen, he is somehow spot on. He wouldn't have been my choice, but I accept him as this wonderfully inspiring character who has been through so much and always drives himself to be a better person. Jackman also has to carry us through the entire story, pretty much from the first shot to the last, and he simply manages, that's all I can really say. My favourite characters, who are actually supporting roles, but yet the most iconic, and essentially patriotic folk heroes, uh, if you are French, are Marius, one of the rebels, Eponine, who disguises herself as a boy to fight uh, on the barricades, and is um, the grown-up Cosette's rival for Marius' affections, and little Gavroche, who I mentioned earlier. All great performances, or at least Gavroche is as good as one can expect of a preteen actor. I'll talk about Eponine first, since she's the real love interest in this story. Every male fan of Les Mis, and so far the male critics, shares my wish that Marius ended up with her instead of Cosette. She's just more interesting, and there is something sexy about a woman who would go to such lengths to fight among her comrades. In this version, Hooper makes a point of showing her strapping down her breasts. Samantha Barks is fairly well endowed, and I'd imagine this actually hurt. And then she dons the famous hat. The Eponine look is so iconic that the Monty Python musical Spamalot deployed it to represent Frenchness. Indeed, you couldn't have a better national hero. Barks is perfect in the role, and I already have a crush on her. Her big numbers on my own and A Little Fall of Rain are beautifully sung and perfectly captured. Get Eponine wrong, you've got Les Mis wrong. It is through falling in love with this portrayal that, if I hadn't already fallen in love with this film, I certainly have now. Eddie Redmayne plays Marius, and makes the biggest impression after the conflict. 
He sings Empty Chairs at Empty Tables, a song I so often associate simply with nostalgia, again though in the context of the story, with the close-ups and the performance of the actor, you feel so strongly that this man has seen all of his friends gunned down before him, and then survived with nothing more than a broken arm and a limp. What we today call PTSD and survival guilt are rarely the subject of musicals. Like I Dreamed a Dream, it has never been so powerful before. I was anxious to see how Hooper would handle the finale. Such a big choral number, and such an essential part of the show. How do you pull it off without falling at the last hurdle by abandoning your commitment to a naturalistic style? And I would say that Hooper, in fact, has invented a new way of doing a musical movie. But the Les Mis simply cannot be topped, making this unique for all time. I'll simply say that he found a way, revealing only that it involves some flashbacks which in a way feels like a curtain call, with a lot of focus on Eponine, who usually gets a lot of applause, despite not actually appearing in that many scenes. Did Tom Hooper succeed? Let me say this, I wanted to smoke a cigarette and then go straight back in to watch the next showing. I often get that with live theatre, where it isn't actually possible sadly, and rarely get it with film. It wouldn't surprise me if this film was still playing in cinemas for years. Thank you, Tom Hooper, and well done.